We are still in the book of Nehemiah, and it seems like we're taking a long time going through this, but I trust that you are taking some time to read on your own time the story of Nehemiah. It is an awesome story. This story of rebuilding, the story of, of this reconstruction project, it has a lot of, lot of applications for our lives, personally and also corporately. There's much that we can learn from this rebuilding project that God put in the heart of Nehemiah to be able to do. And that's what God wants to do in our lives. He wants to rebuild and restore us his way. And because God provides and God is good and God is gracious, as we listen to his word and as we listen to his ways, God starts to do those things in our lives and, and transform each and every one of us. But as in the story of Nehemiah, when God starts to work, the enemy is not happy. And so there's challenges that come with that, and we need to be mindful of those things, and we need to be trusting God in how he is going to work those things out and to give us the discernment on what he is doing and what the enemy is doing so that we follow God's word and God's ways. Last week we started looking at this, and, and we started by the different gates that were being uh, rebuilt that were being worked on. And as we saw in chapter 3, the beginning of chapter 3, the sheep gate was the first gate that started this whole rebuilding project. And remember, we, we talk, talked about that. The sheep gate is where the, the animals that were going to be used in the temple sacrifices uh, would be brought in. And so it reminds us that Jesus Christ made that sacrifice for us. That our restoration and our rebuilding spiritually starts with what Jesus did for us when he gave his life when he was, became the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We then saw that there was the fish gate. And the fish gate was where the men of the area would go out to the local bodies of water, if it was rivers or streams or ponds or lakes or the sea, and they would bring the fish into the city. And remember, that's what Jesus, when he called his disciples, he said. He said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. So the picture there is going out and bringing people into the kingdom of God as the men would bring the fish into the city of God. And then we ended talking about the old gate. And the old gate spoke about, the, it was believed the original gate that led into the city, and it spoke about the old way of serving God. It spoke about the old traditions and the old laws that, that people would try to serve God. But it speaks about our old life and how now we have a new life in Christ Jesus, and we have a new relationship, and we start um, with this process of being on this journey with the Lord. This map that we're looking at kind of gives us the overlay of what the wall would have looked like, what the outline of the city would have looked like, and the 10 different gates that led into the city. And so this morning, we're going to continue to look at some more of those gates and some more of the walls and sections that are being built. And there's a lot of activity that starts to happen through the rest of this chapter. A lot of names are being mentioned, of which I'm not going to try to pronounce because I know I am not going to be able to do it properly. I would have loved if it would have been simple names like James or Pablo or, you know, maybe, you know, if it would have been like Stefan. And you say, what does Stefan mean? Well, Stefan's a good-looking guy with a lot of hair, right? <laughs> or if they would have said Hugo, what does Hugo mean? It's a good-looking guy with no hair. <laughs> right? But that's not the names that we find there. But what we do see is a lot of activity that's happening as they're rebuilding the city. And as happens in our world today when there is a movement that starts and some activity starts and more people get involved and more people get involved and more is known, it's like momentum starts to happen. And that's what we see. As Nehemiah is writing this and we're starting to understand that there's this excitement that starts to build as the, the wall is being built and the gates are being restored. But interesting, as we go through this and we see this excitement, we see more people getting involved. We see different sections of the wall being restored. We see different parts of the city being restored. And it's really awesome when you get to look at this. And if we take the time to study what, what we're being shown here, it's not just limited to the wall and the gates that were being restored. Other people who normally would not get involved, we see get involved. Other things that we don't think about being restored because the story focuses on the wall and the gates, we really do see that there is more that is being restored. And so if you're able, I would ask if you would just stand just one more time as we look at just a couple of scriptures, a couple of the verses in Nehemiah chapter 3. 
And we'll just look at verse number 7 and 8. Last week we ended up with verse 6, so we'll just take off from there. And the Word of God says, Next to them repairs were made by the men from Gibeon and Mespah, Melatiah of Gibeon and Jordan of Moroth, places under the authority of the governor of trans-Euphrates. Heziah and Hezariah, one of the goldsmiths, repaired the next section. And Hananiah, one of the perfume makers, made repairs next to that. They restored Jerusalem as far as the broad wall. Father God, we thank you for your word this morning. And we thank you for the time that you've given us to gather here corporately. For the purpose of just worshiping and glorifying your name. For the purpose of just giving you honor and glory. And now, Lord, as we pause to hear your word, I pray that you would help us to be sensitive to what the Spirit is saying to us individually. That each one of us, Lord, would take what we are sharing today, your word, and that we would apply it to self, to me. You know my needs. You know where I'm at. You know each and every one of us and where we stand today. And you knew before we got here what we had to hear and what we needed. So let our hearts receive what you have for us. Let our ears be sensitive to that. Let our minds comprehend what you are speaking to us about. And let your will be done. We give you the praise and the glory. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. All right. May please go ahead and be seated again. They restored Jerusalem. That's what this chapter was about, the restoration process that happened during this story in the life of Nehemiah. And what we see from verse 7 to 12 is all these names, and we see these sections of the wall, and we'll see towers that are being identified, different things that are happening, activity that starts to build among the people as God had sent Nehemiah to Jerusalem and said, hey, uh, you know, we're, we're in disgrace. We're in great trouble. The wall is torn apart. The gates are burned down. Everything's a mess. And remember that uh, in chapter 2, the people said, well, let's get busy. Let's get to work. And people started working on this. But what we see, and I think it's important for us to understand, is that not only were they focused on the wall and the gate, but there were other places within the city that was also being restored. In verse 7, when it talks about the places under the authority of the governors, the trans-Euphrates, what it's talking about is the residences where the leadership of the governors would reside. So the, re the reconstruction or the rebuilding wasn't just the wall. We see that the homes were also being restored. We see in other parts of this chapter that there are other parts that were being restored. And we also see that many people from different levels of responsibility with different skill sets with different talents, were also getting involved. It wasn't just a small group. It wasn't just a small segment. But when you look at these verses, uh, for example, Melatiah and Jordan, these were, Melatiah was a leader of people. He had some responsibility of authority. He had some, some position of, of, of administrator. So he was a leader within the community that was also involved in the work. And Jordan was a prophet. He was a man of God who would bring the word of God to the people, but he also was involved in the work. And then in verse 8, we see where it talks about goldsmiths that were getting involved. And we see where it says perfume makers were also getting involved. So the picture is that there was people from different levels, different walks of life, different areas of responsibility, different skill sets. Some rich, some poor, some young, some old, some weak, some strong. But it was an effort where everybody was getting involved as they understood that they were rebuilding the city of God. And then it talks about in that last verse we read in verse 8, that broad wall. And so at first we're saying, wait a minute, the, the, the reconstruction was talking about the wall around the city and the gates. But now it's talking about this broad wall. Well, there, was there only one wall that, that Nehemiah was working on? I think we have an image here that we can show another picture. Maybe, maybe not. So this is another rendition you can see on the, let me look at this way, on the right side, the city, but then at the bottom of the picture, you see this other wall that's there. This was the broad wall that's mentioned here in verse 8. And what this wall was protecting was that body of water. 
If we look at 2 Chronicles in chapter 32, Hezekiah, as the Assyrians were coming and invading Judah and then coming towards Jerusalem, Hezekiah says, well, wait a minute. This army is advancing. We want to protect the city, but we also want to protect the water that's for the city. Why should we allow the enemy to have access to that? And so if you read chapter 32 of 2 Chronicles, you see where this additional wall was built to protect an area outside of the main portion of the city. And I point that out because to me it spoke about the fact that, hey, it wasn't only rebuilding the wall and the city, but there was work happening outside of the city as well, as God had sent Nehemiah to go and do this work. In verse 9, we read about other leaders that are helping out in this project. In verse 10, we read about people who are rebuilding and constructing in front of their homes. So now we're talking about the residences, the people, the dwellings where the people lived was also being worked on during this project. And in verse 11, when you read that, it talks about the tower of ovens that was being rebuilt during this process. Now, the tower of ovens was where the Levites would bake the bread that was going to be used in the temple. But it's also a place where people would bring their goods to be cooked and be prepared to be able to provide for the nutrition of the people within the city. It was this huge tower that had several ovens that people would come and they would cook their goods there. So as we look at this, the picture in my mind, I'm saying, wait a minute, it's not just a wall now. We're talking about building up... uh, Outside of the immediate city, we're talking about building up where people can provide for themselves. That's building up the infrastructure. That's building up the sustainability. That's building up the economy that is within that city. As I said last week, God is a God of purpose. God is a God of order. God is a God of intention. And when God has a purpose and a plan, he's thought everything out and he already knows what should happen, how it should happen, and who's going to be doing it. God is not a God of confusion or a God that's, you know, you get to a certain point in your life and, and then you're like, well, now what? And God says, you know what? I didn't have a contingency plan for that. Let me get back to you. God doesn't say, hey, you know what? I didn't think that was going to be possible. So maybe we got to do plan B. Maybe we got to change. No, God is perfect. And he knows exactly what his will is. And he knows exactly what he's going to do. We're the ones who sometimes get it mixed up and get confused. And we're the ones that don't realize and don't recognize the path that God wants us to be on. And as we look at this rebuilding and uh, construction, we see how God thought of everything. Not just protecting the city, not just putting the gates up, but outside of the city, the community, the well-being of the people, the economy, restoring their homes. This project was a massive project that was happening not just limited to the wall, as many of us may think when we first read this story. Even in verse 12, if you look at verse 12, what you see is that there's children that are getting involved in in this project. When it says that the daughters of the, the men are also helping out. So this is men, this is women, this is young, this is old. It is a communal effect or work that is happening as we read this story. And then when we get to verse 13, it talks about another gate. And it talks about the valley gate. Now, the valley gate is interesting because as historians and theologians and archaeologists have looked at this and studied this over the years, it is believed that the valley gate was probably the lowest in elevation of all the gates. So that was interesting. And the other thing is that it was positioned, if you remember that little map, it was positioned in a part of the city where it led to all the different regions and valleys in the area. And so anybody, Jerusalem is up on a hill, anybody in those regions and those valleys could be able to look up and they'd be able to see Jerusalem and they would be able to see that gate to be able to enter in. It was probably the easiest gate to enter in through because of its proximity to all the regions, because of its elevation to be able to enter in. So it was called the valley gate for a couple different reasons. But you know, it reminds me of when Jesus... When Jesus was giving the Sermon on the Mount, and he was talking to all the people and telling all the people, you know, he's talking about the kingdom of God. He's talking about life. And he's saying life is difficult. And you're going to have trials and tribulations. You're going to have struggles. You're going to have all these things that are happening. 
And he says, you know, there's all kinds of ways you can deal with this, but I've come to show you the way to deal. I've come to show you the right way to deal with these things. I've come to give you new life. And in Matthew chapter 7, he says this, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go by it. You see, the world offers all of us different ways to live our lives. The world says you can do whatever you want, however you want, when you want. It doesn't matter. There's no accountability. As long as you're good with it, it doesn't matter how it affects anybody else. Who cares? Do whatever you want. Advertisers live on that. Nike's, what's Nike's slogan? Just do it. Right? Just do it. Who cares? Doesn't matter in the end. Yes, it does. Because all those paths lead to destruction. There's only one way, and that is through Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus said, Amen. But he also said in verse 14, Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. So that's great news that there is a way, but it's also kind of sad because it says that there are few who find it. Such a rich, beautiful way of living to, be, to have eternal life, but many people don't want to live that way. Many people choose not to go through that narrow gate. Many people choose to just live their lives and listen to the lies that say, you know what? Live your life because when you die, it's all over. No, it's not. When you leave here, you step into eternity. Every one of us has an eternity. The question is, where will you spend eternity? Will you spend in the presence of God Almighty? Will you spend it with Jesus who says, you know, I've come to save you? Or will you spend it apart in eternal condemnation and in hell? Jesus said in John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. He is that valley gate. He is the one that we can enter into. But the other thing about it is that because that gate, that valley gate was at the lowest part, it's also a picture of how we come to the Lord. Humbly. We come in a humble way. Not prideful. Not arrogant. We realize that we need salvation. We realize that we're messed up. We realize that, that we need a Savior. And so we come to the Lord humbly and ask him for forgiveness, and he accepts us and brings us in. Look at what Peter says in 1 Peter. He says, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your cares upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. Isn't that awesome? He cares for you. He cares for me. And no matter what you're going through, He was right there. Today, some of us are struggling with some things, and guess what? He cares about you. He cares about your health. He cares about your finances. He cares about your relationships. He cares about your work. He cares about your family. He cares about everything because he cares about you. And he has a better plan for each and every one of us. But Peter also gives us a little bit of a warning here. Because he says in verse 8, be sober. Be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. See, Satan wants to twist the words of God. Satan wants to cause confusion. Satan wants to cause all kinds of problems in your life. That description there, I'm, you know, I'm reminded of, of my grandson, Micah. He's learning how to make sounds of the animals and stuff. And so I'll say, hey, Micah, what does a lion say? He goes, Rawr! right? You know, he puts his hands up. And that's a picture of Satan. And he wants to put up his claws and he wants to, to growl and make all kinds of noise and, and make you feel fearful. But when you are in the hands of the Almighty, when you are in the, in the hands of Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter how much noise or how many fangs or claws or problems or trials or tribulation the world or Satan or sin want to bring, we stand on our Savior, we stand on the Word of God, and we are assured of an eternal promise. The valley gate speaks of us coming to the Lord humbly. And it speaks that anybody and everybody for whatever walk, whatever region, whatever valley, whatever trial, whatever tribulation can come into the kingdom of God into this gate. The next gate that we talk about or that the Bible talks to us about is in verse 13 when it talks about the dung gate. 
Now, in some Bibles, it may say the rubbish gate or it may say the, the refuge gate. But what it is is just that. It's where the trash is taken out. See, the city would have this situation where everybody would take all their garbage, all the useless stuff, all the stuff that was wasteful, all the stuff that wasn't needed, and they'd take it out of this gate. It was the done gate. You know, in our homes, wherever we live, if we live in a house or an apartment complex or if we live in a town home or once a week, typically you have the, the trash truck that comes and picks up all the trash and takes it away. Either takes it to a landfill or takes it outside the city limits. In some places it's burned, in some places it's just buried, but it's removed from where we live because it's of no value. It is waste, it is garbage. And so this gate was the dung gate where all the people in the city would take all their garbage and would go out that gate, and outside this gate they would burn all the trash. Speaks to me of how God works in our lives. That once we come into a relationship with God, once we come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, he says, you know what, I have so much for you. I have all these beautiful promises. I have all this, but I got to clean up all the stuff, the junk and the garbage that's in your life. And we got to get rid of that. And we got to get that out of your life and take that out through the dung gate to get that out of the way because God has so much for us. Second Corinthians says this, therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. This is an active step on our part. You see, when we come to know Jesus and we start to read his word and we start to let the Holy Spirit minister to us and we start to get understanding, he reveals to us those things in our lives that we got to get rid of. Those things that we got to take from our lives and go to a dung gate and put it outside. There's no room for that stuff. That old person, those old habits, that old language, those things that you used to do, the things that, that didn't edify you or bring blessings to you, God is saying, get that out. I've made a way. Take that outside. Let, let the Holy Spirit burn that up. Just get rid of all of that because I have so much for you. And this is the active step that we need to take each and every day when we come before the Lord and ask God to help us understand. Purge me. See what's in my life. Help me to see, Lord, if there's something that I've said, something that I did, some attitude that I have, some action that isn't pleasing to you, that's garbage, so that I can get rid of that. But you know, we're not perfect. Christians aren't perfect. We're going to mess up. We're going to think things. We're going to say things. We're going to do things that, in the spur of the moment, we react and we don't realize and we're going to sin. And it will happen because we are not perfect. We're just forgiven. And we're in this journey into the land of perfection. But God is so merciful and so good. And God loves us so much. Look what First John says. My dear children, I write this so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, you have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Oh, how awesome is that? That when we mess up, oh, Jesus, I, I blew it. I messed up. I, 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 the Holy Spirit's convicted me. I've done something wrong. And, and we go to Jesus, and guess what Jesus is doing? He's our high priest. He's standing before God the Father, and he says, oh, she's mine. I paid the price. Look at my hands. Look at my feet. They messed up, but I paid the price on Calvary. I made it possible for that to be forgiven. They've come and asked me for forgiveness. They belong to me. He's mine. She's mine. And they've recognized they've done something wrong. So that's been blotted out. It's taken care of. And God the Father says, yeah, you're right. That's mine. They belong to me. The Dungate. The dung gate was a picture of taking all the garbage out of the city. It's a picture of the, the garbage that's in our spiritual life being removed and being taken out. And when you look at that, that, that gate, the position of the gate, it's interesting because for me, I look at those things. And like I said last week, I, I always start like, how did that work and how does this work? And at the top of the city is the sheep gate where the restoration process happens. And at the bottom of the city is the dung gate where all the garbage gets thrown out. It just, to me, it's an image of, well, starting there and letting God take everything out the backside. But here's the other thing is that it's believed that when the people would take their garbage, refuge out of the city through the dung gate, they would not come in the same gate. 
They would go out. They would burn all their garbage. They would just get rid of all that. And then they'd come in to the next gate that we see in verse 15. And that's the fountain gate. And the reason they would do that is because now they've been burning all their trash. And now they've been around that. And the smell, the ash, the odor of that they would, might, might be on them. And so instead of coming back in, they would go to the fountain gate. Because that's where water was for them to be able to wash their clothes. To be able to wash themselves before they came back into the city. In other words, they would clean themselves before they came back into the city of God. It reminds me of what Romans says. In chapter 12, it says, Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Being in fellowship with God and having him purge us and clean us and and our minds being transformed and our attitudes being changed and our hearts being molded the way that God wants us to be. And to cleanse us and clear all that old stuff and just renew us into the relationship that he wants us to have with him. King David, the Bible tells us he was a man after God's own heart. He wanted to do everything that he could to please God. He wanted to do everything that was right in the eyes of God. But King David messed up. King David had an affair. King David had arranged for the husband of Bathsheba to be out in the front lines and lose his life. And and King David was trying to hide a sin. And the prophet came to him and said, hey, this is what you did. And you're wrong. And you have sin in your life, and and God's not pleased, and it has to be taken care of. And and King David, recognizing now the horrific mistake he had made, and how awful was what he had done, and how he had sinned against God, and sinned against the people. So he, he writes Psalms 51, and he says this, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, and blot out my transgressions. Wipe them away. Clean me. Restore me. And then he says in verse 2, wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. King David's giving us a picture of that fountain gate. That once we've gone out and burned everything, we come and we say, Lord, just wash me. From head to toe, clean me up. Restore me, revive me, and bring me back into that fellowship. In verse 25, or from verse 17 to verse 25, what we read and we continue as we read this chapter is more people that are being named more sections of the wall, more areas that are being worked on. And you see that there's names of regular people. We see there's names of priests, of of skilled people, unskilled people, all kinds of people that worked on the walls, they worked on the homes, they worked on on the roofs. This massive project that was happening during this time. And then we get to verse 26 where we are introduced to another gate. And this is the water gate. Different from the fountain gate. But it is the water gate. See, the water gate was in an area where just outside were these wells and these streams of fresh water that people would go and get water to be able to drink. It's like when you're working out in the yard or you're working outside and you've been working all day long and you're just hot and just thirsty. You can't wait to get a drink of water. Yesterday, there were some of the guys working here. They were in the field, and we were grateful for the men who were able to help out there. And it was warm in the morning, so they had just limited time. But I bet when they got done doing with the weeds and stuff, all they wanted to do was go sit down and drink a cold glass of water to restore and refresh themselves. Many years ago, when, my, uh, when I was younger, my mom and dad were doing all kinds of work in the yard. And I remember uh, they were just covered with mud and stuff and and my mom's face was red and they sat down the patio and mom said mijo give me a glass of water and so i went i got her a glass of water and i gave it to her i put an extra shoe grabbed it and she drank it and it was just a ah she said mijo you saved my life (laughs) because she was thirsty and she was hot and it was that's the picture you get of this, of this water gate that you go and, and, and the people that were working would get refreshed with this. Well, you know what? That's what the Word of God and the Spirit God does for us. When the people were celebrating the festival of the tabernacles, this is feast that they would remember and they'd live out in tents and huts out in the, in the open. And they remember how God brought the ancestors through the wilderness And that whole thing. And so every day the people would gather and they would have time with their family and they would remember those things. But on the last day of that festival, it was an enormous 
feast, an enormous uh, a time where everybody got together. Everyone got together to worship. Everyone got together to just praise God. Everyone got together to just have fellowship. And it was throughout the week they were going and, and kind of in family units. But at the last, it was party on. Everyone's together and we're just going to have a great time and celebrate what God has done for us. Jesus says this in John chapter 7. On the last and the greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let everyone who thirsts come and take a drink of me. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Jesus was saying, listen, I'm here to fulfill all your needs. And that thirst that you have, that hunger that you have, that's not something that could be satisfied with the things of the world. It's not something that could be satisfied with finances or materialism or relationships or any kind of vices. It's not something that can be satisfied with a career. It's not something that can be satisfied with relationships. It can't be satisfied with anything because that is, that is a spiritual need that you have. And that thirst that you have can only be satisfied with a drink of the living water. That water gate represented that drink that people would take that would refresh them, would restore them, would renew them. And that's what Jesus is for us. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He says, I am the living water. And anyone who thirsts, anyone come unto me and take a drink. And that need will be satisfied. The psalmist said this in Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me to lie down in green pastures and leads me beside quiet waters. That's an image of green pastures. A good shepherd would lead their flock to green pastures. Meaning it was nutritional. It was beneficial. He wouldn't lead them to junk food. He wouldn't lead them to the garbage. He would lead them to where they would be able to satisfy themselves and be refreshed and be fortified and be renewed. And that picture of going by quiet waters. Have you ever gone on a hike and then you get to a stream or a river and it's, you're in the shade and all you hear is just that water bubbling? And you're like, man, if this could just be my life all day long, every day. It's so tranquil and so quiet. Verse 3, it says, he refreshes my soul. And he guides me along the right path for his name's sake. When we come to the Lord, he refreshes our soul. Many people are struggling and they're combative and they have this, this, this thing that's going on within them and they're never satisfied. They're never happy. They're trying all kinds of things. They're trying to see how they can make a better life. They're, they're uncomfortable and they don't even know why. It's because within them there is a need that can only be met with the relationship with Jesus Christ. The water gate is that drink of water. That spiritual drink that satisfies the need. The prophet Isaiah said this in Isaiah 40. Do you not know? Have you not heard? It's like, guys, don't you get it? Don't you understand? Don't you know? He says, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. I don't know how you feel, but I remember when I was younger, I mean, I would be up all hours of the night. I'd be able to do all kinds of stuff. I didn't, I felt like I was invincible. Now it's just a chore to get out of bed in the morning, right? And you're all laughing because you know what I'm talking about. Then you had that first cup of coffee and you're ready for a nap because that was a chore or maybe tea, right? We're just sap. We don't have any strength. We don't, but here, spiritually speaking, he's saying, don't you know? He's here to refresh you. He's here to revive you. Spiritually, you don't have to be worn out. You don't have to be tired. You don't have to be. You have living water that's available to you to restore you. And he goes on and says, but those who hope, those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Oh, what a joy to be with God, to have that relationship. How great it is to drink of the living water. That in spite of walking in a parched land, in spite of walking to the desert, we are refreshed, we are renewed, we are revived, we are sustained, we are fortified. We are made new and fresh every day in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to be wrapping up here real soon here. But the other thing that we look at this chapter as we're reading here. Remember last week in verse 5 we spoke about those men. 
men at Tokoyo who, for whatever reason, did not want to get involved. They said they wouldn't put their shoulder to work. And some texts said they would not bend their necks to the work. Meaning that even within the people that were residents, people that were in the city, did not want to get involved in that project that was happening. The leaders were involved. But for whatever reason, the nobles, the people did not want to get involved. As I said, maybe they didn't like Nehemiah. Maybe they didn't like his approach. Maybe they didn't agree with him. Maybe they thought, you know what, this is the only thing. It's a waste of time. But they did not want to get involved, according to verse 5. But when you get down to verse 27, it seems it was a change of heart. It seems something happened. Maybe as they saw the momentum and they saw the activity and they realized the benefit of getting involved and and seeing what was happening, they got involved. Because verse 27 tells us this. Next to them, the men of Tekoya repaired another section from the great projecting tower to the wall of Opal. See, so those guys at the beginning who did not want to get involved now are getting involved. Those guys who were sitting back or sitting on the sidelines and saying, I don't agree with this. I don't like what's going on. Now, here in the chapter, we see, hey, it makes sense. I see what's happening. I want to take the section of my wall. I want to get on whatever gate. I want to help wherever I can help. And you see this project that just explodes with activity as Jerusalem is being rebuilt and fortified. Next week, we'll continue looking at some more of these gates. But last week, we looked at those first three gates, right? We looked at the sheep gate. We looked at the fish gate. We looked at the old gate, which has a significance and talks about us starting this journey. This week, we look at these other three gates. We looked at the valley gate, the dung gate, the fountain gate, and the water gate, which talks to us about coming into a relationship with God, which talks about him taking out those things which are of no value in our spiritual lives and, and taking them away from us which talks about us being washed by the power of the Holy Spirit in his word and talks about us being refreshed in him. And it speaks about us being restored, being revived, and being fortified spiritually the way God wants us to be rebuilt. We're reading about this reconstruction project, but really what we, sh- what we should be learning is how God wants to rebuild and restore us individually and as a corporate body. Amen. Join me as we pray. Father God, Lord, it's amazing how your word continues to speak to each and every one of us. Many people will look at the Bible as some ancient stories, as some historical information, maybe fairy tales, maybe something that that is good and might have some practical applications. But Lord, it is your word. It is you speaking to us. It's you speaking to me. And every time we open your word and we start to read it, Lord, you are talking to us, speaking to our need, speaking to our condition, to our circumstances. It is you, Father, who wants to share your love with us. Lord, I pray that we would appreciate your word more and more. That each one of us would take the time privately to get into the word, to get into study, to get into the meanings of the names of these these gates and the names of the people and how you tie everything in because, Lord, you are perfect and it's amazing. You're always blowing our minds with, with how things developed in how your plan and purpose is perfect and how those things happened back then but Lord they're happening today individually Lord you are rebuilding us you're restoring us your word is refreshing us and you care about us so much that in spite of whatever we may be going through individually you're right there and it is in you that we find the answer It is in you that we find our comfort. It is in you that we find mercy, grace, compassion, and love. You are our hope. And Father, I pray that if someone today doesn't know you, someone today who does not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, they've heard about him, 
Maybe their whole life they've, they've seen stories and gone to church and maybe during the holidays they, they check off the box because that's what, what our, our ancestors said we should do. But they don't know you. They just know about you. That today would be the day that they'd made that decision. To say, you know what? I'm entering into the city. I'm entering into the kingdom of God. And I know I got a bunch of garbage and baggage that's in my life, and I want God to take that out of my life and fill it with his promises and with his love. And I want to be washed and made clean. And not only today, but every day, I want to be refreshed and renewed and restored in him through his word, through prayer, through fellowship, to enjoy the blessings that are found in the kingdom of God. We thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you that you restore us each and every day. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.